Well, hello and welcome to Dronfield Baptist Church. Now, I'm looking slightly casually dressed because the reason being that on Sunday, not the recording day, on Sunday we should be in the school field at William Levick School. And that's why I'm dressed like this, because today's not Sunday, because hopefully, if the weather is kind, though it's looking a bit iffy, we should be all outside worshipping together. So therefore, I've bought something really important. I've got a chair, one of my garden chairs, for me to sit on and to go, oh, that's better. A bit of luxury listening to the minister preach. Or we've also got something else. Something that uh, you should have always on not a good picnic, but at least when you're outside on the grass, a nice thick blanket. This is an English heritage blanket, so it's a bit of class. So there we go. If I feel like sitting on that, which I might do later, that's what I will do. Let's move my chair a bit. Now, Today we're thinking about a word that Mark in his Gospel is the only one who uses. It's the feeding of the 5,000. And in Mark's Gospel, he mentions grass like Luke and John and Matthew do, but he's the only one who says that it was green. He mentions green grass. So I would like you to pause the pastor because you need to do two things. Firstly, either find some grass from your back garden, or you can draw it, or like me, you can paint it. And then secondly, you will also to need to have some bread and wine, because today is also a communion service. So go and find your grass, pause me, find your grass, organise your bread and wine, and then we'll carry on. Mark says it's green because greenery in Israel 2,000 years ago, or whether today, is not unusual, but it's only seasonal. And so when, for most of the year, the grass is brown, it's either died off or it's just brown and looking like dirt, for most of the year, but, every, but twice a year, when you have the seasonal rains, the grass turns green. And the greenery was always a reminder to Israel of God's goodness, of God's faithfulness, of God's love, but also of the call of God upon Israel, upon his people, to live obediently and trustingly in God. So we're going to sing some songs, and I want you to hold your grass while we sing the songs. Feel its te texture. Just imagine being somewhere as you sing the songs where there's lots and lots and lots of green grass which speaks of life and vitality, of God's goodness and of God's love. So we sing two songs. The first song is I See Your Face and then creation sings the Father's song. So let's sing and worship together. In every sunrise 
So holding, still holding your grass, let's come together in prayer. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father God, for the commonness of green grass. And for us, it's something familiar. It's something we always see. We are rarely used to seeing brown or, or dried off or burnt off grass. But we thank you for the testimony, the song of green grass that sings of your ongoing faithfulness and love. We remind ourselves this green grass speaks of your many gifts to us, the gifts of creation, the things that we receive day by day by day, things like rain as well as sunshine, of our food and of our drink, of the way in which our bodies work, or when they work well or when they don't work too well. We thank you for all the many ways that grass reminds us of the sheer wonder of your creation. 
We thank you for the simplicity of grass. And we pray that you'll help us in our lives to live lives that are simple. We pray your forgiveness that so often we complicate our lives. We make our lives difficult. We cram them with things that are unnecessary. All these things become central to us and we lose sight of you and we ask you to forgive us. We thank you that your son came as one who delighted in the simple things of life in green grass itself. He came and he met his friends, he met strangers, as in the story of Mark 6, with thousands around him on the green grass. And they spoke about he who is the giver of life. And we thank you that he continues to give us life day by day. We thank you he went into the darkness of death that, and then was raised to life again, that we may know his life in ourselves. And as we'll be eating and drinking later on, thinking about his death and resurrection, may we be a grateful people for the great gift of life we have in him. And we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit who brooded over creation and who broods over and in our lives. May we know his life-giving presence stirring us to love and to trust and to walk with you. And so, Father, we pray that whenever we see green grass, we will remind ourselves of your abundant and great goodness for us. And we ask this in your Son's name. Amen. So there's a the green grass. Let's, I'll put it there. Let's put the, keep it there, held in place. Let's read the story of the feeding of the 5,000 from Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 34. He says, when he, as Jesus, went ashore, he saw a large crowd and had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples approached him and said, this place is deserted and it is already late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. Will you give them something to eat, said Jesus. They said to him, should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? He asked them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said, five loaves, and two fish. Then Jesus instructed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. He took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke the loaves. He kept giving them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided up the two fish among them all. Everyone ate and was satisfied. They picked up 12 baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. Now those who had eaten the loaves were 5,000 men. Now when we read about a crowd of over 5,000 men, and there may well have been children and women present too, we don't know, we get a bit twitchy. We think 5,000 people crammed next to each other. What about social distancing? Jesus, though, didn't feel twitchy. When he saw this vast crowd gathered around him, rather than being twitchy, he was compassionate. He was compassionate because he saw this crowd and he recognised that they were still far from the kingdom of God, far away from this kingly God's embrace. He knew also that they were still living in that sense of exile, of God not keeping his promises, of the temple being deserted, of the land corrupted and polluted, the Romans being there. And he knew that they were people whose sins were not yet forgiven. There were those who were still chained by the powers of sin. And so he had compassion upon them. He described them as being like sheep without a shepherd, which actually speaks about the people, the nation, being a nation without a king. Completely vulnerable, 
completely open to attack and to be devoured by their enemies. They needed a king to survive and they didn't have one. Or rather, they didn't recognise that their king was in their presence, that their hope and their future and their confidence were standing before them if only they had eyes to see. Now in verse 31, it speaks of them being in a remote place. Now, the language here isn't like describing Bournemouth Beach, which from Dronfield is a remote place, but also is heaving with people, and neither is it like a picture I saw in the paper this week of two OAPs sitting in their deck chairs, and what I thought was sand actually was brown grass. They were sitting in St James's Park in London, surrounded by all the busyness of central London, but it looked as if they were in a remote, deserted place. Actually, the language here, this remote place, is of pasture land, land designed for the keeping of sheep. But it's been untended, it's been uncared for, and so it becomes deserted. And that's how Israel felt, that's how these people felt who followed Jesus. They felt both uncared for and untended. They had gone to wild because they dreamt for rain, they yearned for rain, as much as they yearned and dreamt of God keeping his promises to them, enabling them to live in a flourishing place where the grass is green rather than in a deserted or brown or barren land. They yearned for the promises of the shepherd, of the king to come true in their midst. And they didn't realise it yet, but their prayers had been answered. Because that's why the crowds, when they followed Jesus, did so with joy and with laughter. Though they couldn't see him clearly yet, who Jesus was as their king, as their saviour, yet there was enough there in the things he did, in the things that he said, for them to begin to maybe see dimly, see a bit clearer, actually this strange carpenter, Maybe he is the shepherd, the king, that God had always promised. Because when the crowds followed him, they had that sense that in this Jesus, the grass, rather being burnt and barren and brown, would become grass that was green, grass filled with life, grass filled with energy, filled with vitality, filled with hope. Because in this remote place, Jesus is described as the one who brings life. He brings the life that God always promises. That's what he taught. When he says that he sat and he taught them, that he was speaking about the kingdom, of God's promises being kept, of them being able, as our last song will say, of standing on God's promises. That's why they're so excited, because Jesus says in him there is the life, and that if they trusted in him, they would rather know this, the death, that sin, death, and the devil would deny is real. Instead, in Jesus, they would discover that he would feed them the life of God himself. He would feed them by the word, he would feed them by the bread of life, and also he would feed them with bread bread, with real bread, physical bread. That even though they were hungry, yet they would leave that place fully satisfied, filled up with the things that Jesus would give them. And both his teaching and this bread and fish, fish provision would be on a scale, on an abundance, that's not only breathtaking in its extravagance, but, ra but also life-giving in all that they receive. Jesus says to the disciples who've come to him, say, look, these people, these thousands are hungry. 
send them off, tend them to go to the villages, to go and buy themselves bread. And when Jesus says, will you feed them? They answer, what, 200 days wages? That's the 200 denarii, 200 days wages. We haven't got that sort of money around us. To which then Jesus says, well, go and ask what you have. And when they come back, the answer that they give demonstrates if only they had the eyes to see that they had enough. They had five loaves. And for Jesus, five loaves, as small as they are, so it seems, are enough for 5,000. Jesus sees what they have and he says, you have all that they need. The disciples had been out teaching and preaching and demonstrating the presence of the kingdom. Jesus had sent them to the crowds and to the area around them. Go, he says, and show the kingdom's presence. And in this story of the feeding of the 5,000, they had to go, oh yes, I understand now. I've learned that you can feed these people even with what seems not enough. For the disciples, they only see the little. They see the many around them and they go, this little is not enough. Jesus sees the little and he says, this is enough. Because in this miracle, in this feeding story, Jesus shows that he is the shepherd because he not only gives them the word of life, he will feed them as a good shepherd will. He will send them home well fed. He will show them by the breaking of bread and the sharing of fish that he is their king, that he is the one who is able to give them life in all its fullness, if only they dared to walk and to trust in him. And that's why verse 52, which I didn't read, is so important. Later on in the chapter, Jesus says that they were completely astounded. That's when they were on the water in a storm. Jesus calms the storm. It says they were astounded because they had not understood about the loaves. Instead, their hearts were hardened. The lesson of the feeding of the 5,000 was for the disciples to go, we believe, we dare to trust you even more. But all they saw was people being filled. They didn't see Jesus truly as their king, as their shepherd, who will look after and will provide for them. They still had so much more to learn and to understand. This is also a communion service. So the disciples, they took bread. They had loaves, I've got sliced bread. Jesus took the loaves and then it says he blessed it. So press a pause. I want you to bless the bread. Say thank you to God for the gift of bread, the bread of life, the words of Jesus, but also for this bread that speaks of him who gave his life for us. And having given thanks to God, let's remember the words Jesus said. Jesus said he took the bread, having blessed, he broke it. He said to them, this is my body, which is given for you. He says, take and eat. So please serve each other. Take some bread, and as you eat it, give thanks for the word of life that you receive from Jesus day by day. But also give thanks that all that we receive from him is a reminder of the life given for us by Jesus who gave himself upon the cross. There you are. I've got my picnic set here. Jesus took fish, but we will take wine. And again, please press pause. 
and again say thank you to Jesus for the gift of the wine, which reminds us of his body given for us, rather his blood given for us. The, Jesus said, he then took the cup, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant sealed with my blood. And let's serve each other, or if you've got little cups, let's wait till we've all been served. Let's drink together, giving thanks that his blood was shed for us. We eat and we drink because we know that Jesus is the shepherd. He is the king who's given his life for us. A question. Does 21st century Dronfield, Britain, does it seem like a remote, a brown and barren place to you? Say with the ongoing situation with the coronavirus, with now our country in its most severest recession in history, of the uncertainty of what's happening, does it seem to you as if we live in a remote, a brown and barren land? Well, actually, we don't. Yes, it is difficult, but the grass is this colour. The grass is green. It's not brown. It's not barren. Because the shepherd, as we've eaten and drunk, has come. He's come. He's lived. He's died for us. Because he has died, we know that the kingdom has come. And one day the kingdom will come in all its fullness. We know as we've eaten and drunk that Jesus has died. Sins are forgiven. We live the other side of resurrection. We live in the land of new creation that is bursting with life into all that God has made. We live in the presence of the Spirit who's been lavished upon us. Pentecost has happened. And Pentecost happens again and again as the Spirit is poured upon us. And that's why we eat and drink. We eat and drink because we live in amongst green grass, in the life that God has given. Jesus, in verse 52, he tells the disciples who've seen a wild storm when they were terrified for their lives, stop, cease, and they are in awe of Jesus. But Jesus reminds them of something they'd seen only a few hours earlier, but had forgotten. They had not believed. They had not trusted. They were afraid. And may the same not be said for us here in Dronfield. In fact, in verse 52, May Jesus say of us that we were not completely astounded, but we celebrated, we rejoiced because we know that Jesus is king in whom we can trust and rely. It says that they had not understood about the loaves. May we be those who understand again and again what the loaves are all about, of life, of God's promises being kept. It says that their hearts were hardened. May our hearts remain soft as we trust in Jesus, relying on him, daring to believe he is the shepherd, he is the king, who will give us the bread of life, who will feed us, and who calls us to trust in him, because in him we have enough. And even if it seems little and the need is great, 
five loaves, 5,000. For Jesus, he says, that roughly equates to being enough. May we dare to believe that that is enough to, for us today. Let's come together in prayer. Let's pray. As we've eaten and drunk together, we pray for our fellowship. We pray, Father God, for, for Emma, Mike and Sandra Herman's niece. We pray afresh your ongoing healing touch of her. Back in hospital for scans and for tests, we pray that she may continue to grow stronger. We thank you that they've reassured her that we are praying for her. And so we pray, our loving God, that you'd be near to her. We thank you that Dave's dad has come th well through the surgery he's had for a pacemaker. And we pray that he may continue to grow stronger and to grow more healthier. We pray that you may revitalize him and bless him, our loving God. May you be with him, his wife separated by 40 miles as we record, but we pray that as they get home together again, that they may know your goodness and your love. We pray for Debbie, Chris and Alison's daughter in Canada. Thank you that at last she's been in fracture clinic. Thank you for the way she's surrounded by friends, by members of church who love and who bless her, as if she is so immobilised at this moment. May she know, we pray, that in you she has enough. And again, we pray for Pam's daughter, Kirsty, we pray afresh your strength and your blessing on her. Facing a difficult illness, may she know this, day, we pray, your strength and your peace. And for Pam too and all the family, that they may know your presence in all that they are. We pray, Father God, for the youth of our land. We pray for those who this week have received their A-level results. We pray for those who are so disappointed about the way in which the system has allocated their grades. We pray for those who feel aggrieved and dealt a hard blow as they try to get their heads round their options for the year to come. We pray, Father God, for those who got exactly what they want, who are excited for the year to come when university life itself will be still strange because of the current crisis. We pray for those who are waiting for the exams this Thursday, the GCSE results. Things say about Gabe and of Thomas and of Eleanor. We pray your blessing upon them as they wait for these decisions, for these results, and of the keys that will enable them hopefully to unlock the next stage of their lives. May you bless them and bless all those in our town, in our country, who are waiting their results this coming Thursday. We pray again for our teachers, for those who are so disappointed because they've seen how hard their students have worked and yet have not received their rewards that they deserve because of the sheer level of hard work. May you encourage them as they face a new cohort, as they seek to encourage this, this current year's intake into the top sixth. May you be with them, we pray, May they be encouraging, as ever zealous and enthusiastic, that they may inspire their students to persevere in their studies, we pray. We pray, Father God, for all who struggle with questions of mental health. May they know your peace, we pray, our loving God. We thank you, Father God, for all those who watch over, who diagnose, who prescribe, who supervise, May you be with all who work within our community as psychiatric nurses. May you give them the strength and the peace that they need, our loving God. And we ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn, Standing on the Promises of God. Let's sing confident that our God, as are his promises, reliable and dependable day by day because he is our shepherd and our king. So let's sing together. <laughs>
Let me bless you as we conclude our worship. May the Lord keep you safe in his grasp because he promises to. And may you know that you can never fall out of his everlasting arms because he is our shepherd, he is our king, whose word is reliable and whose word is dependable. Amen. Have a great week. And for all those who are watching this, for those you know who are receiving exam results, we hope and pray that they'll have great exam results. May you, be, may you know all know God's presence this week to come. Hope to see you soon, either around town or see you next week in church or on the screen. And next week, of course, is Don. He's bringing the word of life next week. So let's pray that Don will be blessed in all that he is too. See you soon. Bye.